All right. As our children make their way out to Children's Church today, if you'll take your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 40. Exodus chapter 40. And again, I appreciate so much your being here today and being a part of this service. It's not the same when you're not here. And um, so thank you for being here and being faithful today to the Lord's house. Exodus chapter 40, uh, we're going to start reading down in verse 33, uh, down through the end of the chapter, verse 38. Just giving you a moment to get there. Exodus chapter 40, let's start reading again, verse 33. And he reared up the court, Moses, it's talking about Moses there, round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. That is the title of the message this morning, the glory of the Lord. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. John chapter 1 verse 18 says this, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. In John chapter 6, verse 46, Not that any man have seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. One of the things that the Bible teaches us is that no human being can see God with human eyes and live. But his presence was enveloped in this cloud that we just read about. This cloud that came down to the people. It was something that the people could look to. It was something that the people could follow. And directly beneath the cloud was the Holy of Holies, that special, special place in the tabernacle that was built. And there in the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies, there was the mercy seat of Christ. The Ark of the Covenant was there. And that is where this cloud came down. And the glory, it says here, the glory of God filled that place. Now, the glory of God is an interesting topic to study in the Bible. It is mentioned nearly 400 times. But I think none of those times are as interesting or more interesting than the time that we have here in this text. This was the Shekinah glory cloud. Uh, You may have heard that term used before. The word Shekinah is an expression that was coined by the Jewish rabbis that was uh, it was a form of a hebrew word which literally means he caused to dwell in other words he meant to dwell there there was a purpose behind that cloud coming down it was this shekinah glory cloud that led the children of israel you remember across the red sea and through the wilderness now it's interesting that god mentioned several identifying factors with his people and one of them is This two-word phrase, the glory, the glory. Listen to what Romans 9, 4, and, and, and listen for that term. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoptions and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? I want you to notice, first of all today, when does the glory come? When does the glory come? Look back in verse 34 of our text. And it says, then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation. Notice that word, then. Then. That means that something happened before. Something preceded the cloud coming down. This Shekinah glory cloud, God's presence. What was it? It was the last part of verse 33, those last five verses, or words of that verse. So Moses finished the work. After Moses finished the work, then a cloud covered the tent of the tabernacle. It was when God was finally on display in the tabernacle. It was 
when the obedience, through obedience, the work was done. Folks, the same can said is, is still true with our lives as well today. When we are obedient to do what the Lord tells us to do, when we display God in our lives, the glory will fall upon each of us. Now, you can always tell when the glory is on somebody because these dear saints of God will have a radiance about them. You can see it in their faces. You can uh, see it with the spring that's in their step. And you can definitely tell by the way that they talk that God's glory is upon them. Again, this glory only comes when we display Jesus and when we obey his word. In verses 17 through 32 of our text, it speaks about Moses as he was setting up the tabernacle. And as you go through those verses, you will find that seven times it says, as the Lord commanded Moses. As the Lord commanded Moses. As the Lord commanded Moses. All the way through that passage of Scripture. What does that tell us? It tells us that absolute obedience was necessary. It was absolute necess absolutely necessary. It was what God requires. God requires absolute obedience, not partial obedience. I am amazed at how many times people have come to me over the years for counsel or direction or to ask my opinion biblically about something, but then they sit in my office and they basically tell me that they've already made up their mind what they're going to do and they're just there to get my approval. To kind of somehow manipulate God's opinion on things and say, well, God approves of what you've decided to do. That's not the way that God works. God expects us to obey Him, not, tell us, not to tell Him what we're going to do and then do that. It's totally contrary to the, what the Bible teaches us, how we do things. Partial obedience. Get, let's get this in our head. Partial obedience is always disobedience. Partial obedience is always disobedience. A, a child that obeys and respects his mom or dad part of the time is not a partially obedient child. No, that child is a disobedient child. You see the difference. I'm reminded of the mother who wanted her boy to be obedient to her wishes, but it seemed like every time she told him no, he would either throw a tantrum or do it anyway. And so after... Uh, an especially trying day, she finally threw her hands up in the air and she shouted, All right, Billy, do whatever you want. Now let me see you disobey that. Some of you are going to get that later on, all right? There, look, th there is nothing like dealing with a strong-willed child, is there? If you've had one, you know exactly what I'm talking about. God deals with us all the time. And we've got strong wills. But God expects us to be totally obedient to Him. What a goal! What, that is something to strive for every day. God, I'm going to obey you all the time. Now, I know we live in this flesh. I know we have to deal with temptation all the time. But that's something worth shooting for, isn't it? To obey God all the time. To be faithful to Him all the time. As I look around the sanctuary this morning, I see the faces of, someone, of people that I believe that's what you do. You, you strive to do that. You strive to live for God. You try to put God on display for others to see Him in you. And yeah, you have those weak moments like we always do. You have those days that you get down, but most of the time you have a radiance about you. God, or, or people know that you have spent time with God. People know that you have a relationship with Him. You have the glory on your life. If you want the glory of God on your life, when the glory comes, it comes when you obey the Lord and you display the Lord. Notice, secondly, where does the glory come? As we see in verse 34, it came on the tent of the tabernacle. It came on the tent. But in the New Testament, we find that it came on Jesus. Now, another way of putting that is in the Old Testament, it came upon the picture. In the New Testament, it came upon the person. And, and let me explain to you what I'm talking about. The Bible records four times that Moses experiences the glory of God. Four times. The first time was when God took Moses and he hid him in the cleft of the rock. He hid him behind a rock over here. He could barely see out, maybe like a slit of light coming through. And God passed by and Moses was able 
to see the tail end or the essence of God. Again, he could not look upon God and live. So he was able to catch a glimpse of God's glory. That was the first time. Another, the next time Moses experienced God's glory was when he went up on the mountain to receive the commandments. And he was up there and he's spending time with God those number of days and he comes back off the mountain. And you remember what the people said? His face is glowing. They knew that he had been with God. He had a radiance about him. I preached a message years ago called the Christian suntan. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. He was glowing. He was glowing with God's presence on him. And then here in our text, he experienced God's glory as it comes down upon the tabernacle in the form of a cloud. But then there's one other time in Scripture where we see Moses involved. And that's hundreds of years later in the New Testament. Moses and Elijah is up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. And it was at that point, you see, Moses saw God's glory as a picture in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, he saw it upon a person, Jesus Christ. Jesus was as white as light. And Moses got to witness that. Let me tell you something exciting today. If you know him as your personal Savior, it's not going to be long before you and I are going to be in that presence of his glory for all of eternity. We're going to get to see what Moses saw. And oh, how I look forward to that day. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them, precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And listen to the last part, the last phrase. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm looking forward to that. How about you? I heard two people that's looking forward to that, all right? But, but anyway, I'm looking forward to that day. But until that day, a day in which we are in the presence of God's glory all the time, the Bible tells us that the, that the glory does come down here in our day at certain times. And by the way, you, all, you can only see it through spiritual eyes. You say, what are those times? Where, where does God's glory come down? Well, we know that it came down on Jesus. John chapter 1, verse 14, And the Word was made flesh, the Word speaking of Jesus, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hebrews 1.3 says, Who being the brightness of His glory, and the express image of His person. So we know it came upon Jesus. Secondly, God desires for it to be on the church. You say, where do we get that from? Well, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 21, Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. God wants His glory to be manifested through the church. Now, there are different kinds of churches with many different kinds of worship styles. But when church is done right, it glorifies the Lord. Not the name of the church, not the preacher, not, a, not the music, not a program, but Jesus. That's where the glory goes. Everything that, that God created, was, it was made by Him, and the Scripture says it was made for Him. Now think about this. Any air you breathe, any food you eat, anything that you enjoy, are only because God shared those things with you. But there's one thing that He will not share, and that is His glory. That means when a singer sings, guess who gets the glory? God gets the glory. That means when the preacher, every now and then, he'll preach a good message, <laughs> all right, who gets the glory? God gets the glory. When the attendance goes up, guess who gets the glory? God does. When the buildings are built and programs are successful, God gets the glory. And my heart's desire is that our services will hear, uh, here will never uh, have to be pumped up or revved up or worked up, but rather when we leave this place, whatever the service may be, whatever has happened, it will be obvious that it was God who did it. And so on the way out the door, we give God the praise. We thank Him for what He's done. 
By the way, this isn't your church. And this isn't my church. This is God's church. And, and we're, we're, just, we're just blessed that we get to be a part of it. It's all about him. Uh, let, let him receive the praise. Let him receive the accolades. Let him receive the glory. And whether, therefore, we eat or drink or whatever we do, let's do all to the glory of God. Amen? We must always make that our priority. Not only because it's right, but listen to me, but also because it's possible that the glory of the Lord could depart. I want you to let that sink in for just a second. The glory of the Lord could depart from this place. Listen, God doesn't need Macropine Free Will Baptist Church. We need Him. We must have Him here or we're just wasting our time. We should never take Him for granted because He can move His glory down the road to somewhere else. There are plenty of empty church buildings around the world that prove that today. Places where God used to move. That God did some great and mighty things there, but now there are places that are cold and dead and they're lifeless. We have an example of this in the Old Testament. There was a fellow by the name of Eli. Eli was a priest. And Eli had two wicked sons. Eli, for some reason, uh, were given the impression he didn't bother restraining them or constraining them, or trying to, uh, maybe you did try to point them in the right way, but they didn't listen, but they rebelled. And so instead of trying to, to deal with things, he, he kind of swept things under the rug, and he continued with his mediocre ministry. And then one day Samuel, the prophet Samuel, prophesied, and he said, look, God's judgment is going to fall. And when God's judgment falls, when people hear about it, it's going to make their ears tingle. Well, sure enough, Israel went up against the Philistines, and they got the Stephens beat out of them. They not only killed Eli's two sons, but they also stole the Ark of the Covenant, prized possession of the people of Israel. They took that with them. They paid for it later, but they took that with them. And when Eli heard the news, the Bible says that it shocked him so much that he fell over backward, and it broke his neck, and he died. His now widowed daughter-in-law, when she heard the news, she went into premature labor, gave birth to a son, and she named him, very interestingly, Ichabod. You know what Ichabod means? The glory has departed. What a telling name. What a shameful name. What, 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 an, what an awful thing to realize that, that we used to be in God's presence. But now the glory of the Lord is not here anymore. If this church ever moves from evangelism to formalism or emotionalism, God will write Ichabod over the door and we may not even know it. If this church moves from being biblical and going to the liberal, then God will write Ichabod over the door. And we may have bigger crowds, and, and, and we may have more exciting programs, but God won't be in it. And I don't know about you, if God's not in it, I don't want to be in it. It's not worth, it's not worth my time, it's not worth my effort. If we ever replace cooperation and compassion with fighting and personal agendas, God may just decide to move on down the road to somewhere else. Hey, let's just keep God first. We keep God first, and, every, and we won't have to worry about Him leaving. Our prayer should be that God's glory will always reside in this place. Where does the glory come? It came on Jesus. God desires for it to be on the church. It can be on the Christian. Colossians 1.27 says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The same God who can write Ichabod over the church house door can also write it over a single heart. Now, I'm not talking about losing your salvation, but I am talking about losing your testimony. I am talking about losing your influence, losing your effectiveness, losing your glow about you. That is, that is very possible. 
The final question is, why does the glory come? Well, first, His glory comes to show us that He alone should have the praise for our salvation. We didn't save us. All you and I did was this right here, to receive our salvation. That's all we did. We didn't die for us. We didn't do anything good for us. We just received something that had already been done for us. So He gets the glory for that. Second, His glory comes to show that He alone is our protection. When the Israelites, you remember, were trapped up against the Red Sea and it looked like certain death because the Egyptian army was coming very quickly, you remember, you, do you remember what God did to separate those two groups? His cloud, His Shekinah glory cloud came down and it was a light to the good guys and it was darkness and confusion to the bad guys. He protected them. God's glory reminds us that He is here to protect us. And that reminds us, folks, that the world cannot touch you and me. Not as saints of God, it can't. Anything that comes into our lives has to be filtered through God's presence first. So I don't have to run around and wring my hands while the world is doing that, talking about the stock market falling and talking about who's going to be the next president and who's going to be the next invading army and what China's doing. I don't have to get all caught up into that. I should be aware, but I don't have to worry about that. You know why? Because God's glory is on me. And God's going to take care of me. He protects me. Thirdly, His glory comes to show us that He alone is our direction. It's pointed out to us here in this passage of Scripture that one of the things that the glory cloud did was to give the people direction to know where to go, when to go. If the cloud moved, they moved. If the cloud stopped, they stopped. They didn't have to worry about a map. They didn't have to worry about the next steps. All they had to do was follow that cloud that was before. It gave them direction. You know, I've been to many historical places in my lifetime, all kinds of different places, and some of those times uh, I have gone and, and, and kind of viewed it for myself and took, taken it all in and, and read the signs and just kind of followed around. But there have been several times that I've had a guide. I remember several times going to Gettysburg, the Gettysburg battleground, and, and, and times I've, I've gone and with no guide, and then there was those times, Allison, you'll remember, we had a guide going through there, and, and it was amazing how it came to life. It was amazing. They knew what they were talking about, and so they took us to what they felt like was the most important places. They showed us things and events and people Things made more sense by hearing their side about that. And you know what? I didn't get lost. I remember one time going on the Gettysburg battleground, and I got lost. I didn't know where I was. And I had, to, I had to ask somebody, where are we? How do I get out of here? We were driving around up through those areas. and you don't have, you, That doesn't happen if you have a guide. Listen, if you're one of God's children, can I remind you that we may not know what tomorrow holds, but we do know who holds tomorrow. And just... Now look, Jesus will guide us. Jesus will help us make sense of our life. He'll keep us from getting lost. It's impossible to get lost when Jesus has got hold of your hand. My, my Lord knows the way through the wilderness. And all I have to do is follow, as the old song says. Let me ask you today, are you being obedient to God in all areas of your life? Are you displaying His glory and how you're living? Are there areas in your life that you need to let God just lead in? Just take your hands off and say, God, I'll just, I'll just follow you. Whatever God's spoken to you about this morning, I encourage you to surrender that to Him and let the glory of the Lord shine through you. Would you stand to your feet today with every head bowed, every eye closed? We're going to have a hymn of invitation this morning. But right there in, in the stillness of these few moments, would you just ask God this question? God, is there an area in my life that's not completely surrendered to you? God, is there an area that, that I'm just holding on to and I, I haven't turned over to you? God, am I putting you first? life, my actions, my thoughts. God, I really want to. 
God, if you'll show me what I need to do right now, I'll do it. If it's to repent of sin, if it's to make a recommitment to God and say, God, I used to follow you closer. I, 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 used, to, I used to serve you better. I, did, I used to put you first, but I, I've allowed some things to come in. And God, I repent of that. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Help me to get back on track with you. Again, I don't know how God has spoken to your heart, but if he has, I'd encourage you to respond in just a few moments. I'm going to pray, then we're going to sing a verse. That's your cue. Let God lead in your life. Be a saint that has his glory upon you. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking in our hearts. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that you are here with us. And you are speaking to us. And you know what's best for us. You know what we need to work on. You know what we need to repent of. So Lord, as you speak to us right now, help us to respond to your voice. Help us to do what you're telling us to do right now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed, Brother Ray is going to sing. God, speak in your heart. Would you come? This could be a decision today that could change the rest of your life. It could alter how you spend the rest of your days. You may be heading in the wrong direction today, and God has used this message to say, hey, wake up, wake up. You're going in the wrong direction. I want to be there with you. I want my presence to be upon your life. I want to bless you. I, I want to walk with you. I want to protect you. But you got to let me. Would you come today? We've got ladies that would be glad to pray with you if you're a lady here today. We've got men that would be glad to pray with you if you're a man. Why not come and just pray and talk to the Lord what he's talking to you about? Sing one more verse. All to Jesus, All to Jesus I, I surrender. surrender. Is that your heart today? I'm not holding anything back. I'm giving everything. Sing that first verse and mean it from your heart. Would you sing that? Would you lead us? Oh.